I'm trying, and more specifically, I'm trying to get a paper uh, published uh, that tries to integrate relevance realization theory, cognitive theory, with, uh, you know, big five personality theory. Making use of work of, of, of our shared student, Colin DeYoung. Um, and so... Um, so, so tell, me how, tell me about that. Oh, well, the, the, uh, the idea is, you know, well, I mean, it's a long argument, but to, so, um, receive it charitably because I'm just giving you the gist. But the idea is, you know, uh, Colin's idea about um, um, the meta traits of stability and plasticity, they tend to, uh, th well, I should be more cautious because I'm making a proposal theoretically. Um, a plausible way of understanding of that is that they map onto the, the, the meta constraints that are working with in relevance realization of efficiency and resiliency. And so you can see in a lot of machine learning that what you're doing is trying to get the, the system to uh, improve its problem solving learning ability by constantly trading between efficiency and resiliency and that tends to you know push towards stability is that system. is that uh, is that a consequence of the fact that when machines were taught to identify penguins or birds and fish and then they were given a penguin it blew the uh, prediction it, it, system it comes, yeah it, it goes way back it goes back to jeffrey Hitchens. because that's where i derived the idea from the difference between plasticity and stability to begin with and it's in, it's in, it's in, um... So you heard that, did you? I derived the idea from that, from the sources that you're citing as that, its corollaries. That, so... Yeah, I mean, that, that's great. It was from Greenberg, I think. Greenberg? I think. That, uh, that's very convergent, so thank you. For okay, that. yeah, okay, okay. And, I mean, and you, you might want to know that, you know, because he was a colleague of both of ours, Jeffrey Hinton at U of T, I mean, the, the, that basic idea, what the paper I published on relevance realization in 2012 basically attributes that core idea to him and his wake sleep algorithm for, for deep learning. So long story short is there's, and you, 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 you're reinforcing it, which thank you, I appreciate that. There's this growing convergence between sort of what machine learning is saying about, you know, opponent processing and then, you know, the, the what personality theory is saying about the kind of opponent processing between stability and plasticity. And so the, and then, and then what we're trying to do is say, right, there's a, there's a, there, we can take it, it sort of embodied cognitive science and properly integrate those um, uh, together. Uh, and then there's a, there's a, an additional idea, which is that uh, personality, there's might be an aspect of which it's affording not only individual cognition, but it might be, and this is this goes back to your classroom example. I think it might be also a way of affording uh, a distributed cognition, improving relevance, realizing because you can see the various traits as moving subpopulations to emphasize stability, others to open things up, and so what so personality is simultaneously helping to glue cognition together within the individual, but also glue distributed cognition together, which goes back to your point about the role oh, of personality, right? That would, um, yeah. that would explain to some degree the existence of the niches of the, I mean, because imagine yeah. that there, there's niches, obviously, that these personalities yeah. fill because otherwise they wouldn't be useful. And exactly. The exactly. niches are valuable. Your claim in some sense is that the niches are valuable because they both expand and stabilize the Exactly. Uh, the map. The, the analogy to biological selection is is, in, is intended in the work. So you, you're picking up on it. Fairly. Yeah, it has to be if you're thinking. Well, it has to be if your thinking is going to go anywhere, right? <laughs> I think so too. I think so too. Yeah. Well, this is why I was interested in your reaction to the idea that you know we're selecting on the basis of logos because that's a well. You know, you, I mean, you've been talking about the metaphysical status of consciousness, and that's what drove me to, to bring that issue up, because the issue of God, in some sense, hinges on the issue of the metaphysical significance of consciousness. That's what it looks like I to me. That's right. Do you think that's right? I, I, I think it's right in that this way. It depends. I mean, I don't want to do the simple party trick of what well, depends what you mean by God, but what I'm, what I'm saying is... Very funny. I think there... I don't or think real. It depends on what you mean by real. But when you ask questions like that, is God real? It depends on just as much on what you think is real as what you're asking about God. Exactly. So and and here's, the, here's, the, here's what I will say as a claim. I do not think we are going to solve, and I mean that in cognitive scientific terms, the problem of consciousness without addressing fundamental ontology. I've been arguing for that. In yeah, that's, because that's where... where 
um, the consciousness field studies has got it wrong. Consciousness isn't the fundamental mystery. Reality is the fundamentally mis exactly. fundamental mystery. And the secondary mystery is the relationship between consciousness and reality. Because it, is, it, is it a primary relationship? That's the fundamental ontological question. And one of the offshoots of that is, well, well how can you... Where is the reality without consciousness? Like, I haven't been... That's that objective world that's out there without us. But what is it that's out there without us? Without, forget us, consciousness. Well, and that's what, and, 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 and what people, what people need to hear is that one of, I, 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 this is an odd sentence because, yeah, but one of those exciting yeah, areas. It's going to be one of many, John, so <laughs> like rack them up, man. One of the exciting areas within, you know, metaphysics right now is the rise of what's called speculative <laughs> realism. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and, and 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 what's called object-oriented ontology, um, and the, it's 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 like object-oriented programming as a metaphor. I won't go into it, but the the primary thing that they're on about is they say, look, if you are going to be a realist, again, I'm, I'm compressing a lot into very little, but if you're going to be a realist, you have to admit into your metaphysics relationships between things that are do not depend for their existence on us being aware of those relationships. So yes. things have to be able to influence and disclose each other in a way that is dark to us. And then what's like that dark mean? matter, dark matter on the on and the on, on the, the metaphysical, metaphysical plane. Plane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, and what does that mean? Well what it's interesting, you know, it, it means it means to some degree that you can pick up the orbit of the earth using Foucault's pendulum. Yeah, it means that. You know what I mean? It, what I mean it means that because somehow the all is embedded in the in the in the in the in the in the singular. I got what you And you see that with Foucault's pendulum. Sorry, yeah, I was I was playing between. I was just there was two references in my mind. There was the there was the the historical thing, and then there was the book, right? And I said, oh, okay, right. And so yeah, I think that's right. And and you know, people like Morton. Yeah. So then that, that brings up the question, is, is, there a, is there a distinction between the unknown real and, un, and the unconscious? That's, that's why Jung's question of the munis yundus, I think. But that's why I asked you earlier uh, about that's not right. in the world, Jordan. That's why I asked you yeah, I know, about I know, yeah. John, that's exactly yeah. why I'm bringing it up. Yeah, exactly. But, so, so is the unconscious in the world, then, the, then you know, the corollary question, obvious, is, obviously, is the unconscious well, in the world striving to make itself conscious? Well, well, I don't know about that, but let me answer something that I think you're going to love from a Jungian perspective, which is what how Harmon talks about it. Uh, I'm going to use... The, 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 this language, but I think it's fair to him. He thinks the only way, so he picked, he, the idea he has, and I think there's something fundamentally right about this, is objects are not only shining in, phenomenon, but they are also withdrawing. They are always inex, they're inexhaustible, right? They're, 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 uh, so they are simultaneously shining into our intelligibility, but they are always withdrawing into their reality. There, right, right, because every object is more than it appears by that's an infinite right. amount, exactly. and that's partly exactly. what you experience in experiences of awe is the inanimate. Yes. Right, but, because the infinite is contained somehow within the finite. Okay, this is great. So, well, here's a proposal he has that the only the the, the and it's a, it, it goes towards my my claim of a participatory kind of knowing. The only way I can really participate in right in the withdrawal of this object into its unconscious because if i'm conscious of it I've, I've defeated the very thing i'm claiming it is how i can relate to my own unconscious the, the way there's aspects of me that withdraw beyond my consciousness but nevertheless shape and make an impact my participating in this axis if you'll allow me a metaphor allows me and he means this in a profound sense, symbolically, aesthetically, to participate in the realness of this object. That's 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 that that's the kind of stuff that's going on right now in speculative realism. Let's get back to your four tier. Um, I have to digest that in ways that I don't. I'm not going to be conscious of. Um, I don't know how to follow that with the appropriate question. 
I, I it's the depth within that allows you to appreciate the depth without. It, it, it makes me think of the Psalms. I mean, it's the verse, you know, the, the deep calling to the deep. And that's not you calling, right? That's what I mean about the transjectivity. Yes, well, that's also, the, that's also akin to the metaphor of rescuing the father from the underworld because we're constantly doing that. So the father is in the inner underworld always as a consequence of our reflection of the external social and natural world. Ah, so you're, I didn't see that in when you've, when you've talked about it before. You're seeing a deep kind of resonance between those where each discloses the other. Am I, am well, I you saw it, I'm just pointing out my ah. vision of it, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if that's the analogous vision. I, I th yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I, I think... You know, and it's... it's yeah, the, uh, we're rescuing, as we're rescuing... It's the discordance, see, it's interesting because it's the discordance between the map and the reality that drives the seeking of the Father within, right? Because, yeah. you, you see what I mean? Because yeah. when, 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 you're, when your desire does not manifest itself and you despair, you call to the Father within to reveal himself. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's and so that's the that's the rescuing of the father from the dragon of the of chaos. So so you the, the, the And you're chaotic, right? Because you're this you're chaotic, you know, you're your books behind you, but okay. which is why you array them behind you in no small part, but as you said, in your own defense when you're putting your ideas forth, I'm just the gist. Yeah. There's another T shirt. <laughs> but it's the same idea as kenosis. Yeah, the, I know, the emptying. Um, and, and, and I'm deeply interested in the relationship between kenosis and henosis. Uh, because I don't I, know henosis. Oh, henosis is the, is um, sort of... It's the, horrifying and great to talk to someone who knows a whole bunch of things I don't know at all. Oh, thank you, Jordan. That's quite the compliment coming from someone like you. Um, um, Henosis is the it, 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 what it, it's the it's the it's the it, it, it's the it's the it's the summation of the neoplatonic anagogy, the neoplatonic ascent, uh, whereby the the one within you becomes one with the one without until there is only the one. It's it's ultimate atonement, and also it, it has the sense of atonement because it's the ultimate healing of that which is most existentially distressing to us, which is our being separated from the ground of reality within and the ground of reality without, and also separating them. Yes, and that is what is most existentially distressing to us. You yes. agree yes. with that? Yes. So that, that's why I titled my next book the title that I am titling it, which is We Who Wrestle With God, because that's, the, that's our fundamental problem, is that dissociation. But I believe that's the case. So that that oh, that calls something forth for me now the wrestling. But then that means that, that, that okay please please go ahead. Well, with what, that I, first. what I what I was going to say is you know, you know we're, we're 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 talking about this bivalence of how reality presences it to itself. This is Heidegger's big thing, right? And, and there's a sense in which it yeah. shines it shines into our intelligence. It shines but, forth, but it also withdraws, right? It, right, it, it right, right. Into, it's moreness. It, 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 it shines with its suchness and it withdraw, withdraws into its moreness. And, and wrestling is like that, if you think about it. Because wrestling, I'm making contact, but I'm also being surprised. Think about the two, the two, the two phenomenologies of our mm -hmm. sense of realness. One is when things are confirmed, and oh, it's real, because look at how it all fits together. Right, right, and then the right. other is, oh, please, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That surprises okay. me. That's yes. right. That's right. Yeah. That is the two things that are the most real. Isn't, yes. that, isn't that something? Yeah, and wrestling, wrestling is both of those. And notice it's a conformity metaphor too, right? You have to come into conformity, literally form yourself to the body of your opponent, right? And you're, right, so there's the shining, but there's also the realness because they're shocking you from beyond. I, 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 I hadn't picked that up on the wrestling metaphor. The wrestling metaphor is actually pointing to, it, it, it brings together Right? The two ways in which reality grabs us, the confirming from within well, and the, the, the surprising from without. So that's why we're spoken to in parables, isn't it? I think it so. It takes us thousands of years to make them conscious. And then we keep doing so, and we keep doing so to make them more and more conscious. I mean, it took, I did, you know, taking apart Genesis like that was really revelatory to me. Because, But I, I differed from the atheist because I text... I, 
approached the text with reverence and ignorance and humility, believing that I was nothing in comparison to what it contained. You thought that there were truths available through transformation, not just through information. Well, what, are we stupid? Are we stupid? Is well, that why we were guided by this book for so many thousands of years and preserved it? Is it because we're stupid? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I, So maybe I that means there's something I don't know about it. It's Paul, or we're all stupid. Either right. I'm stupid, which is highly <laughs> probable, or we're all stupid, which is not so highly probable. Uh, I think, well, I mean, uh, as I've said, I think m one of my deepest criticisms of the new atheists is, is precisely the, f the fact, I, I think I have a lot of criticisms of theism too because of the way it has bound itself. I mean, current theism it has bound itself to a Cartesian uh, 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 conception of modernity and reality. And, and that, that's why. Go into that. Go into that. Well, I want to talk to you about dogma and spirit a bit. Okay, let's well, leave that. Go into what you just said. Okay, so I'm going to put a, I'm going to say thing and we're going to put a pin in it because we're still trying to do the four P's of knowing. <laughs> but but, uh, but the, the new atheists lose the, 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 the three other P's and they lose. They, 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 they look for scientific knowledge in the Bible, not paying attention to how it cultivates wisdom. And the fact Right, that and not knowing that there's any difference between scientific exactly. knowledge and wisdom. And this is what I talked about with Stephen Fry recently, because Stephen, who is allied with the atheists, knows that there's such a thing as wisdom, which is why he pursues and embodies myth. But he's annoyed at the church because of its dogma, and he confuses the church with its dogma. Exactly. But, you know, I'm, I'm also going to say a few positive things about dogma. Dogma is the map. I, I think I, I think dogma is, you know, in signal detection theory, I think dogma is the in, the inescapable need to set the criterion. At some point, you can't, like, yes. in, in signal detection theory, you have to set the criterion. And, and all you do to set the criterion, this sounds like Pascal, is you assess the relevance of the risks. Because if you, well, I'll gather more information, but then you have to set the criterion for that. Yes, like, yes, like exactly. Again and, again, and at some point... Yes, that's right, just, that's yeah, right. Just, but you, but you okay, so the criterion, the criterion we're talking about is the worship of that ultimate spirit. Well, and, and, That's and, and, the setting of the criteria. And there's a dogma, there's an element in which dogma serves that. So we can't just, because Fry says, well, I like the spirit, but not the dogma. It's like, no, because you no, know, because you have to make a decision. That's your point. Okay, that's right. And in every act, there's a decision. So in every act, there's a worship of the dogma, because you set the criteria. Right, but you set the criteria, but that's not the same thing as making the connection. Don't forget that credo is later, and I, I, I say it should always be in service to religio. Religio, which means to bind, that's that connectedness we've been talking about throughout. And the point about setting the criterion, and this is like a, you know, this is like a William James thing to say, the point of setting the criterion is to get as reliable a continuity of religio as you possibly can. And when credo goes from giving your heart to I assert, we stop making credo, we stop conceiving of credo in a way that sees it intricately in service of religio. And that's a part of my critique of what's going Okay, happening. so that seems to lead wisely into the four areas that you were going to discuss. Well, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I went back to, uh, we have propositional, and then of the non-propositionals, we have procedural, then we have perspectival having to do with consciousness, and then finally we're down to the kind of knowing that we, 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 we keep bumping up into, which is the knowing, uh, I'll use it, a sort of a Gibsonian way of talking about it, the knowing that creates affordances that makes all the other knowings possible, right? There's a way in which biology and culture and my online cognition shape me and shape the world so that they fit each other. I mean, this is Geertz's even notion of what culture is. It's It simultaneously models the world to me and models me to the world. That's the participatory level. I, I use a metaphor from Geertz, Chris and I do in our work, Right, of the agent or in a relationship, which is like your forum for action, right? That what what participatory knowing does is it gets you to assume certain like it's a process of co-identification, what the Stoics talk about. I assume an identity as I'm assigning identities to things such that affordances between me and it emerge. I'm a grasper, that's graspable, that's an affordance, and therefore I can come into relationship with the cup. That's the level of participatory knowing. And that grounds everything else because without the affordances, you can't get any of the other kinds of knowing going. You can't get a grip. Yes, you can't get Marvel Ponti's optimal grip. So here's what I would say. 
The participatory knowing gives you a field of affordances. The perspectival knowing making making makes certain affordances salient to you perspectively. That gives you a situational awareness. The situational awareness tells you which skills from your procedural knowing you should bring to bear. And then once those skills are in action, you are getting the right kind of causal interaction with the world for your propositional evidence. I don't, I don't think that you realize how much you pack into those statements. Maybe you do. I mean, I know you thought, about, I know you know you oh, thought about each yeah. of them for years, but you know there, there's a lot. It's like the cup metaphor you used. There's a lot lurking behind the scenes there, and you, you hit your listener with that when you lay out that. So I'm going to ask you to do that again, if you would, and I'm going to listen to it again. I'm happy to do so, and I, 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 I know that my... Presuming passion, that if I don't understand it, there are probably a few other people who don't. I think that's a fair, who are listening. That's a fair assumption. Um, and I do not want my entheos uh, to undermine my attempts at logos, so I'll we'll put it that way. Um, so, the participatory knowing, you know, we participate in affordances. It generates a field of affordances for us. Yeah, okay, so that, let, let me stop you there, okay? So... My value structure determines what field of affordances manifests itself to me. Depend, so tell me what more what you mean by value structure, because if you mean well, value value is value is is the determinant of my attentional resources. I'm going to attend to that which I believe is most valuable, and so I have a value hierarchy lurking in the background. That's in that deep unconscious, let's say, but that value hierarchy should be predicated on the manifestation of the highest spirit. So what I should want to afford itself to me are those affordances that afford me the opportunity to pursue the path of the highest spirit. If I'm oriented properly, if I'm worshipping properly, yes or no? Yeah. So, sorry, so, it's not a command. Definitely or ultimately, because there's a difference there. I mean, I mean, so, like, uh, uh, like... I probably mean both, failing to distinguish between them, but, um, I mean, in the ideal, but that would be the ideal that I would be what would you say inclined to pursue if I were conscious of its existence? So I, I would me, say. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can back this because this is interesting. Um, I, I'm using the term. I'm using the term affordance because it's become one of the central terms. Within I understand. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I didn't know that either. But that means okay. that. Yeah, yeah. that well, why? Because it, it, that work was shelved. For, I mean, I became enamored of it when I encountered it, but that work was in some sense shelved was, for a very long for, time. Well, there's a personal reason and there's a collective reason. The personal reason is I was lucky to study and enter into collaboration with one of Gibson's great protégés, John Kennedy. And so that's how I learned to appreciate uh, this. The field as a whole, because of the notion that you know, cognition is not in your head, it's between you and the world. That cries out for the notion of affordance, right? It cries out for And it. so it's had its influence now. Yes. Or increased, I mean, More it had its influence, influence to begin with. More than influence, okay. it's now a central construct within 4E cognitive science. Central construct. Now, the idea, now the idea, and I think, I think this lines up with you, but let, let's see. Because the idea is, like, I don't have to be conscious Right of the affordance relationship between me and the cup. That's given by me having a particular kind of body, the cup having a particular kind of location. Now, but what you're saying... You're is, conscious of it. You're only conscious of enough to make use of it. You're only conscious of it, what's necessary in order for you to make use of it. If that didn't work, you'd have to become conscious of more of it. Right, but, okay, I'm trying to get some... Maybe I, I, I'm worried that we're talking at cross-purposes. Um, what I need to say is, right, there is, there is a, a, a constitutive, I'm going to use your term, there's a constitutive value um, of adaptivity and that my affordances uh, arise for me precisely because of the kind of adaptive agent I, I am. So, for example, to use Gibson's, to use oh, Gibson's to be. Or want to be. Right. Or I'm not to. sure it's what I am, or if it's my. I'm not sure if I'm directed by who I am, or I'm directed by my ideal. I think I'm directed by my ideal because it's in the space of desire. That's the thing. Yeah, but. But you. But. Because, um, John, are your affordances affording you, or are they affording who you could be? Well, but I want to say both. Right, I, 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 I don't. I, I don't okay. Want to, yeah, right. I want to oh, say. Okay. Right, because I, I. I, I 
I, I want to be because I want to be able to say that both is sufficiently radical. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that we'll, we'll have to talk. About I mean, we are we are investigating the claim in some sense that the world calls you to become. Yes. So right. Yeah, so yeah. so the ideal is implicit in the affordance. But I would also put the Heideggerian thing on it. My Dasein, my way of being in the world, also calls things forth from the world. Yes. This cup is not, those this are those not graspable to a fly. Right, that it doesn't right. matter for it doesn't doesn't the that agent to read a relationship doesn't exist for them. And no matter what the fly wishes or wants, that's not going to be the case. I want to I want to say that there are things yes. that are the case for me that are consti that play a constitutive role in the affordances that are available to me. That that's what I that's what I want to emphasize. Yes, well, that's the dogma element as well. Perhaps. That's the element of structure. It's the element of, of setting the criterion. It's the element of what already is. And it's respect for that. But it's also the element uh, of, you know, that the world is also shaped independently of me, sometimes by culture, sometimes by technology, but sometimes by nature itself, such that the, I can make a purchase on the world. I, I, I want to resist the romantic notion that the world is a blank slate that I simply express myself upon. The world has its own structure that constrains and puts demands on me. So, the, uh, and sometimes we, mm -hmm. we work with that. Like if if this yes, was revealed in our errors. Yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. And if this if this if this you know if this cup didn't have what Spinoza was called its canatus, it, its 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 structure, its resistance to force, I couldn't use it to hold up to hold water, and, and, and etc. That that's what I meant. So let's say that. A participatory knowing generates the affordances, and we've got some variation on that, that that we're playing around with. But then what I would say is the perspectival knowing makes them salient to me. So this is graspable right now to me, and I foreground it. I size it up. It, it, I salient its landscape around it. It's present to me now in the way that other affordances are not present to me. Okay, why is that different than, than what we just discussed? It, it, I, I don't think it's different, but what I wanted to make room okay. for was the distinction between them, because I wanted there. I wanted there to. I mean, I think you would. I think you would agree with it. I wanted there to be, a, a, you know, a, 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 an unconscious level at which, you know, uh, at which we know the world, in, in, in which the world and I are being co-shaped together. We talked about that uh, before, um, and so I, I, I want. I, 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 that's what I'm trying to make a place for with the participatory knowing. I want to make I, that it precedes us in an important way um, as, as, as sort of self-aware beings. Perspectival the, the room is there before you walk into it. The room is there, but also my body. I mean, this is the big thing about embodiment, is taking the body deeply seriously as constituent of my cognition. If I didn't, I didn't make my body, right? I participated, and I can shape it, I can move it. But, uh, but it's given to you in a sense. Given well. to me, exactly. And that givenness gives, it constrains the way in which the world can be given to me. That's what I'm trying to say. I, will, I want to make a deep, I'm I for that's, that's the definition of reality. Well, I, I, uh, yeah, at least the one sense we were talking about earlier. But yeah. see, I, right. I take embodiment deeply seriously. And so another way yes. of putting it is participatory knowing is knowing at the level. You know, I think that's where the Christians emphasize the resurrection of the body. By the I, way. I mean, what Jonathan said about the Christians emphasizing the body and the goodness of the world over against the Gnostics. I'm a little bit worried about that term because Gnosticism wasn't a, a group of people. It, it's more like a style of religiosity, like fundamentalism. Uh, but I get his point. There were certain, at least the Valentinian... Yes, well, I mean, it really struck me, the, that valid, valorization of the body, this insistence across... And this is something, again, I would say that the new atheists don't appreciate at all. It's like, well, the resurrection of the body, well, what does that mean? It means it means profound respect for the body. It means, it means attributing to b the body the value of the spirit. But it means something psychologically, which is, which is what you're getting at. Exactly. Here, which exactly. is, your it's consciousness is, is not separate in some sense from no, that's exactly. the body. Yeah, so the participatory knowing is at the level of embodiment. And then your, your, your consciousness, your state of mind, makes certain affordances salient to you. That's what situational awareness is. That's what the whole psychology of situational awareness is. Like, how do people pick up on the affordances that are available? How do they make them present? How do they also present themselves to it, right? That co-presencing. 
And that's what you're looking, and then funny, talk about realness. That's what you're looking for in the video game. You know, it's not verisimilitude that predicts that sense of presence or how real the game is. Right. Well, you can tell that if you watch The Simpsons. Or, or play Tetris. Tetris right, lives, exactly. yeah, gives people a sense of presence that's not based on verisimilitude. What it is is, is they're getting into a flow state. They're, they're picking up on affordances. They're making them salient. They're getting a, 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 a dynamic, flowing situation. Music does there. that, too. Yes, exactly. And music is how we do serious play with our salience landscaping. Okay, and now... She says there's a casual outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the perspectival knowing. Once we have situational awareness, what does situational awareness do? Situational awareness basically tells you which skills should you bring to bear. Is swimming relevant here? Well, no. Well, how do I know? My situational awareness. So, that's... So, the perspective That's your ability knowing. to read the story. Well, yes. Right. Exactly. So, which skills should you bring to bear? That's the procedural knowing. Once you've got your skills engaged, and this is the fundamental point of the pragmatist, right? That it's all, sure. it's your skilled activity that undergirds your propositional. Once the procedural yes, knowledge yes, is definitely engaged, then... That's what understand means. Yes, yes, right. exactly. Yes. So that's what I'm doing. You see, I'm trying to build it up, participatory, right, into perspectival, into procedural, into propositional. And the new atheists and modernity and all of this stuff is blocked in a propositional tyranny, and it's cut us off from all of this. And cutting us off from this cuts us off from the body, cuts us off from the primary connection. And that propositional, that propositional tyranny, is that best encapsulated in the idea that, that there's nothing outside the text? Well, I think that's right, except, you see, it, what, 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 it, you know, so I've read Derrida deeply, right, except, right, and, and you know, it, and, and, and Derrida, you know, and I forget who wrote the book, Semiological Reductionism, you know, he, he's open to this kind, kind of critique. Uh, Derrida, of course, has something outside of the text, which is difference itself, right? And that's the whole point. Difference can't be captured in the text. It can't be separated from the text. But it, so he has this doorway, and that's why he gets attracted so much to negative theology. That's why, I, well, I would argue that's why... Negative he, theology, what do you mean? So negative theology is, it was part of uh, Neoplatonic Christianity, heavily influenced by the ineffable experiences that people have within mystical experiences, which is uh, ultimate, and, and it's also based on a critique of, uh, you, you shouldn't think of God as a thing, right? Um, this is the no-thingness of God, not the nothingness, no-thingness. We should also talk about the confusion of those countries, but we'll maybe come back to that another day. Right, so the, the idea uh, of negative theology is you fundamentally, I wonder if this is like uh, Jung's circumambulation, you fundamentally understand God by saying what God is not, but not, of course, randomly, right? Um, what you're trying to do is... Oh, well, that's sort of like the God of the gaps. Well, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's, don't, don't apologize. We're, we're friends talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I, I don't want to derail the, the conversation, so... There, there, there's been, it's been like this, and it's been wonderful. It feels to me like doing Tai Chi. Um, no, uh, it's more of that, it's more of a recognition of, not of the God of the gaps, but of a recognition how our categorical scheme is always inadequate. So, for example, is God an object? Well, no, that's wrong. Is God a subject, like the way we are? No, that's wrong, too. That's inadequate. Right, so God is, well, God escapes our categorical. Right. right. God is, by definition, in some sense, the what escapes our categories. Because God is supposed but, to be the grounding of the intelligibility that makes the categorical scheme possible. At least that's right, the But God's also presence within, present within the category scheme if it's set up properly. So. Right. So, so the point about negative theology, that's why it's not just the God of the gaps. The point is I see, the see, I see, I see. to see within the category, that it's present within the categories, but it's not capturable within the categories. That's what you're right. trying to the do. Category, the, yeah, yes, the reality supersedes the categories. And that, which is why you're not supposed to make idols. You're, why you're not supposed to make representations of well, God. You can make icons. Just to, to, to summon Jonathan back into the conversation one more time. You can make icons, right? And you've got John Marion's distinction between the idol and the what's, icon. What's the, what's the distinction? The distinction. The, the icon does not capture God. Right, that's exactly it. That's an artwork. So an artwork is an icon. Exactly. And yeah. propaganda is an idol. Yes. I would agree with both of those statements. Well, yeah. isn't that something? Because they're they're really, in some sense, far astray, aren't they? But they do map, and so how how cool is that? So art is art is the icon. How cool! 
and and propaganda is the idol exactly man you know and i had these paintings in my house and they were melds of the icon and the idol all right because there's all this socialist realism i have 200 pieces of socialist realism Actually, watching the icon and the idol fall fight with each other but, but, and the problem is they are and, and I, I want to get the etymology of this word they at a superficial level of similarity they can easily be confused they can yes be confused Okay. So. Yes. Well, that they, I, I would say they will inevitably confused in the absence of God. Well, and I because propaganda, like this is something I've been working on too, John. Is that yeah, you know I, that I, we, yeah. we we make religious the next thing on the hierarchy if we don't give to what is religious its proper place. And I think the new atheists are beginning to realize this. It's like, oh, look at that. We didn't eradicate the religious spirit. No, it just we can't. It just moves somewhere, just moves somewhere, else. somewhere yeah. and, it, and becomes pathologized by its association well, is, with that. This is Tillich's critique of ide ideology. I, I, I'm not, well, I, I, of ideology, because I think ideology is a form of idolatry. But this is Tillich's critique of uh, ideology, yes. which is precise. We cannot, and I think You've said things along this discussion that point to this. We cannot, we cannot abandon our ultimate concern. Right? That's his. That's his. Yes, way that's right. We can't. No, so this.